Good morning, Calvary Chapel Tiffin. How are we feeling this morning? Y'all alive? Y'all sleep? I know it's nine degrees outside, but give Jesus a shout. Good morning. How are you feeling today? Good. You're still asleep. Let's get you guys on your feet. Let's get, let's get into worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this place. Lord, again, we know that you are in this place. Help us to show up, Lord Jesus, in this space. Um, we know you have already, and you already placed, you've already touched down. We thank you for being here, God, um, and that we will just worship your great name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. One, two, three, four. Through you, I can do anything. Oh, hold on, I'm sorry. My hand is doing something. Yeah. 
that you begin to speak to us. You begin to reveal to us, Lord, the plans and the purposes that you have specifically for each one of us, Lord. And although there may be things that are weighing on our hearts, but you are standing right next to us saying, let me, let me take that from you. In this word today, Father God, that Ben is about to speak, may you speak and that you may touch those that need to be touched today, Father God. That you may turn someone 180 that needs to be turned around, Father God. That we don't continue to walk down a path of destruction. Lord Jesus, you have this beautifully created path for us. And may we not go astray, may we not take the shortcut, but continue to follow you, Lord. And if today is the day that we need to turn around, Lord Jesus, that you will show that to us. May your love be in this place. May your love cover us today. Father God, again, be with Ben in the word. We love you so much. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And 
uh, yeah, fourth announcement. Kids are already gone, but for future weeks, we are the new kids' room, so we are going to be going down that door, and we're going out that door, and we're going to the left um, to dismiss for children's ministry. So that is all we have. That's it. In the way of announcements. So Ben, we'll come up and read the teaching. Yep. All right, let's go ahead and grab our Bibles. We're going to be in 1 John uh, chapter 5. Let me just put this key away. Give me one second. All right, our places today are going to be 1 John 5, um, Psalm 119, and then the book of Matthew will be in a couple of places. Uh, Matthew 3 will be one of them. Um, real quick, just a couple of little fun things that we're figuring out is, um, <clears throat> so, um, it's gotten chilly during service the last couple of weeks, right? And that comes from, in the back, there's a two-hour set on that thermostat, and we start setting up at like 8, 8.30ish, and so at like 10.30, it shuts off. So if you get cold, or if it gets too hot, just put a hand up because we have to get the key that's over there. And you can just go back and turn it. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I'd much rather we get that sorted out because I don't want you freezing in here. Um, so, you know, you, you know, or you can give me one of these or you can just come up and grab your key and then just go back and reset it. I did it like uh, five minutes ago. So I'm hoping that that will take us through. But we'll see. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's go ahead and grab our Bibles. Um, John, First John chapter five, Matthew one nineteen, or I'm sorry, Psalm one nineteen, and then Matthew chapter three. If you don't have a Bible, um, come up and grab one. Or there's Bibles in the back. We believe that the, this is the most important book that you could ever ever have. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, take this one with you. It is yours to own. Um, we are going to do communion today. If you look on and you go, why in the world would you do communion during a pandemic? Um, one of the reasons that we do communion is for healing. And so for a while, we we went around and around about delaying it. And we got to the point of saying, man, if there was any time that we should be focusing on communion, it would be during a pandemic. So you're not going to hurt our feelings if, uh, if, if you don't want to do communion today we put them in separate containers to hopefully make it as safe as possible how we do communion is if you've given your life to the lord this is a time for us to remember what jesus did for us time to take inventory and so at the end of service we'll have just a little bit of time where the music crew will come back up they'll play a song for us but this will be time for you to go to the lord and just spend some time once a month we set aside a couple minutes just to say jesus did this for me. I want to remember it. I want to honor it. I want to spend some time. I want to look back at the last month, look ahead. And so we, we will do that. Again, don't feel like you have to, but we try to do it as safe as possible. All right, I think that's it. Um, let's ask the Lord to bless our time of study as we finish off the book of First John. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the book of 1 John and the work that you were doing in John the so many times known as the um, the apostle of love also known as John the evangelist we're so thankful for the work that you did through him <coughs> we're thankful for the work that um, that you've been speaking in us through this letter God I pray as we wind down this book and we finish it off I pray that you would speak to us for those of us that have been discouraged this week, I pray that you bring us encouragement. For those of us that have been sick and fell down, I pray that you bring healing. For those of us that have been on a, a mountaintop this last week, <coughs> keep us humble, Lord. For those of us that have been alone, I pray that you would bring unity. For those of us that have been struggling with things or struggling with our neighbor, I pray that you would give us your heart for that person, Lord. God, for any of us, as this chapter will outline, that have ever questioned our relationship with you, I pray that you would solidify that today in this chapter. Speak to us a fresh word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So 1 John chapter 5, last week we were, we were talking about the 
John chapter 4 is really the mountaintop of the book of 1 John. Um, we'll finish it up today. Next week and the week after that, Dom is going to be taking us through 2 John and then 3 John. The week after that, we'll be going through the book of Jude. And then the week after that, we will start the book of Revelation. So read ahead some super cool things. But again, Dom will take us through the next two weeks. We'll do 2 John and 3 John. But today we finish up 1 John. And like you're saying, the fourth chapter was really the pinnacle of this book. And we, John was sharing with us what love is, what we talked about last week. And we, we talked about that love is not something that we get to make up. It has been defined for us through the word. God is love. And he shares what, is it, what does that do for us as his children once we are now in his love. That perfect love casts out fear. So last week was just like, man, it was, it was awesome, right? This week is kind of like a nice sled ride down the summit. It's, a, it's just going to be like nugget after nugget after nugget. And it's just, it's really good stuff. And so let's, let's enjoy kind of this nice sled ride down, um, down the summit as we dig into John chapter 5. So he starts off in verse 1, and he says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, and everyone who loves him, who, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Let's pause right there for a minute. So he picks up very much where he was, where he was last week, right? Verse 1, he says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. You go, okay, wait, I, I'm not sure that I totally understand these begotten. And what, what's he trying to say there? The NLT, I think, makes it a little bit easier to understand. Listen to how the NLT translates it. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. Kind of a neat thing. Six times in this letter, John is talking about being born again. You know, it, it, how he outlined what we talked about last week, when he explained to Nicodemus what it means to be born again, kind of a neat thing that it was the Apostle John, who was his gospel, that explained that. You can definitely tell that this is on his heart, right? He is definitely an evangelist. Because at almost every point, he is coming back to, you must be born again. Those that are born again, be born again. And he... He's an evangelist. <clears throat> Isn't that a neat thing? That there are some of us that we just always go to that point. Have you given your life to the Lord? Are you born again? And it's an awesome thing when you see an evangelist just living in the calling that God has for them. <clears throat> Notice also in verse 1 that there's a difference between a created person and a child of God. Sometimes we can fall into the habit of saying, you know, we're all children of God. We're, we're actually not. You have to be adopted to be a child of God. We're all created beings of God. But to get into His family, you have to be born again. <clears throat> so again, being in Jesus, it means being in His love. His love produces love for Him and then a love for His children probably been one of the toughest things for us to sort through in this letter, right? Is that, that means that we, we naturally should start loving our brothers and our sisters. It's just something that happens when you give your life to the Lord. And what we talked about last week is that you can't really understand love until you're born again. So that means that you can't really love others until you're born again. <clears throat> kind of a little nugget. Verse 2. It says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Well, that's an interesting verse, isn't it? 
By this we know that we love the children of God. Okay, so this is how we're going to know if we actually love our brothers and sisters. When we love God and we keep his commandments. So the confirmation of a relationship with Jesus is that we love his children. And we can confirm that we love his children if we keep his commandments. Now for all the legalists that are in here, right, and typically that's the firstborn, really good at following rules, right? You've really got to be careful with this because what you can start to do with a verse like this is you can start to create a recipe for how to be a child of God. And you could look on and go, well, if A plus B equals C, then I just need to do these two things and I should be good to go. We've got to be very, very careful because this isn't a recipe for being a Christian. <clears throat> this is confirmation of being a Christian. You start with a love for God. And we found out last week you can't actually love God until you've given your life to Jesus. Okay, so for those that are out there that go, okay, so if I'm a child of God, that means that I love my brothers and sisters and that I keep God's commandments. And the, the, the temptation is, well, I'll just text the people in my, you know, in, in our fellowship, like on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I'll tell them that I love them. I'll be good to go. I'll read God's word a little bit, you know, kind of put put it into practice. I'll be good to go. And that's 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 what we have to be careful of because that's not how it goes in this section. This is something that is naturally going to happen, not something that you can just aim for. So we start with giving our, our love to Jesus. Then, by the power of God, you can love others. And then, you will naturally keep his commandments. You say, well, hold on. I love others, and I can follow these rules all by myself. It's like these names from American Idol that used to say, uh, it's a no for me, dog. Yes. <laughs> if you go through your Bible, the Old Testament is thousands of years and millions of people that try to keep God's commandments on their own, and it's it's a it's a, it's a mess. We just, we can't do it. You you can't. Anybody that looks on and goes, well, I'm just going to command, you know, I'll, I'll just obey what He has to say. You, you, you can't. There, there's just there's there's no way to do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, okay, but then what, what, that doesn't sound very hopeful. What, what, what are we supposed to do? When you give your life to Jesus, He gives you the Holy Spirit to come inside of you. And that's something that they never had in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit would come alongside of them, but it never came inside of them. We see this fruit from the Scriptures, and there's three Greek propositions in relating to the Holy Spirit, right? So we have this, he is, um, he's with you, he shall be in you, and he shall come upon you. And in the book of Acts, we see this, kind of this new way of the Holy Spirit coming alongside of people and upon them, and it is this Greek preposition, epi, and it means to overflow within you. And so when you give your life to Jesus, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, but then you can say, Lord, come. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Baptize me with the power of your Holy Spirit. And then he overflows in you to go and serve him. It's awesome. Because we then can have his power to do the things that he wants us to do. Because we can't do it on our own. Keeping God's commands are incredibly unnatural for us. But with the Holy Spirit, not only is it primary... But he has to do it. Right? So once you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and you start to naturally do things that are sinful, the Holy Spirit is inside of you going, we don't have to do that anymore. You don't, you don't have to do that anymore. You used to talk like that. And it, it almost, when the Holy Spirit's inside of you, and you say words that you, used to, you know, that you used to use in a bad way before you gave your life to Jesus, it starts to like, taste the weird. When I gave my life to Jesus, one of the things that became so interesting to me is naturally my bad language started to go away. And I, I had no, no control over this, but the Holy Spirit comes inside of my life, and not only did I stop using bad language, but then when I would hear it, it was like, 
And that's not me, because for, you know, the before I gave my life to Jesus, it was natural to just use bad words as nouns and adjectives and verbs, and it just kind of flew right out. But then the Holy Spirit comes inside and goes, you don't, you don't have to do that anymore. So once the Holy Spirit's inside, it becomes primary to start following God's commands. And then look at what he says in verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. Isn't that interesting? His commandments aren't burdensome. They're not hard. You have been there. You said that they're impossible. They are. For us in our flesh to try to do on our own, we cannot do it. But with the Holy Spirit's help, it totally changes the game. Now, some of us are better at following rules than others. Again, I'm, I've noticed with firstborns, they're, they're, they're interested in the rules. I don't know what it is. My, my, my son is just, naturally, he's good at looking at rules and finding order. Now, I'm the baby in my family, and I can tell you that that naturally doesn't happen for me. I naturally look at it as a party. Right? You tell me rules, and I think, well... Even the firstborns can't do this on their own. Even the firstborns that look on and you, you know you hear we keep his commandments and his commandments aren't burdensome, and you go, Amen, that's right. It's even hard for you. And it's much easier for me to explain it with a human relationship, but we really we tend to do this with God all the time. We naturally rebel against it. And if we were to do the same thing and I were to share what it looks like with a human relationship, you would go, that's absolutely foolish. But we do it all the time with God. <clears throat> I'm going to show you how this works and how badly we need God's help. But watch how we as humans, we typically do with commands. Right? When it comes to God's commands, we typically say things like, and you hear this all the time, right? Um, did God really say that? We love that question. As human beings, we just, we did, did are you sure? Did, did God really say that? You know, somebody brings up uh, having sex outside of marriage. I've heard pastors teach that it's okay to have sex outside of your marriage. So they obviously are going, did God really say this? So it's, it's crazy. You know, but we naturally look on and go, hmm, did he, did he actually say that? Yes, repeatedly. But did he say it in the New Testament? Yes, repeatedly. You're not going to make it very far in your Bible without God telling us that we shouldn't be committing sexual immorality, right? But we naturally do. Did, did he really say this? Then we'll say things like, well, did he mean it? God, I know that you're all knowing and I know that you're all powerful, but like, this translation is actually what you were trying to say, right? We like to just convince God about what he wrote. God, when you really said, don't do this, did you really mean, but you can't do this? And that happens all the time. I mean, you turn on the news, and it, it, it's, it's incredible to hear people talk about, well, we can do this, and we can do this, and we can do this, and, you know, they bring on somebody that says, well, in the Bible it says this, and then that person gets absolutely shredded, Right? We love to try to tell God what he actually meant when he wrote his word. What else do we say to him? Are, are you sure? Okay, Jesus, I understand that you are God eternal, and you were there when the Old Testament law was written down. You were the one that wrote it. But because you didn't mention the specific sin in the New Testament while you were teaching, doesn't that mean that you kind of just voided the Old Testament? Hey, if Jesus is eternal, and he was there when the law was given, why in the world would he void the definition of, let's just take one of them, sexual immorality? Just because he didn't mention every single sin that we deal with as people in his Gospels, it doesn't mean that other things were voided out. 
But we do that, right? You'll hear, well, Jesus didn't specifically teach on that. I mean, John said it at the end of his book, we, you know, we, I wrote down a bunch of things about Jesus, but I didn't write it all down. If I were, it were to take up all the books. So when somebody says, well, Jesus didn't actually say, you've got to be very, very careful. Because you don't want to speak on behalf of God and tell the Lord of all creation, the one that wrote his word, well, he didn't specifically say this. There's a lot of sin that we could talk about. But just because Jesus didn't specifically say that sin doesn't mean that he didn't lump it into a whole other group. And then the last one that we typically hear is, well, well, what could I do? Okay, I hear what you're saying, God, but, like, what, you know, if you're telling me that I can go all the way to here, but what about if I come, like, right here? Like, could I, could I hang out in this, like, right on the edge? It's not, I wouldn't call it sinful. Um, I don't know that I would call it good, but I, like, where, where's my line? And you've probably heard one of those, or multiples of those. I know that I have foolishly used those throughout my time as an unbeliever. Right? Always trying to tell. I can remember, it's, it just pains me to even think about it, but I can remember before I gave my life to Jesus, somebody was asking me, you know, why I believe I'm going to get to heaven. And I said, well, I just think that when I get, when I die, I'm going to come before Jesus, and Jesus is going to say, do you believe me now? Like, how, how dumb could I be? Who would ever come up with that? Somebody that hasn't read what Jesus did. A person that has sacrificed his life so that it would open the door to heaven for anybody that would believe. It's pretty foolish to go, you think I'm just going to appear like a gene and say, do you believe me now? It's crazy the stuff that we can come up with, right? But let me bring it over to the human side, and then you'll see how absolutely silly that it sounds. I'm going to make up a scenario, but let's just say that in the Sandrock household, before bedtime, I say to my kids, no dessert before bed. And then they go through that same line of questioning. Okay, did Dad actually say that? Yes, and I did. And, and, and just imagine my kids going around, but when he said dessert, did he really say that? Like, did he say, I think he said desert. <laughs> We're not going to go to the desert grab the ice cream. We're good. Okay, was he talking? Maybe he was talking to mom. Maybe he was saying to mom, no dessert for, and do you see what, yep, that's what that, it's just grab, because the kids, I, we definitely should have dessert. That must have been no parent dessert tonight. Can you, uh, parents, can you, how do you feel when your kids question something that you absolutely told them? Like, uh, no, I, I, like when I said no dessert, I meant like no dessert. As in, what you have in your mouth right now should not be there. No. I don't know how else I can say it. Yeah, but dad, if we translated it into another, like, no. But you translate it into German, what is it? Nine. <laughs> yeah, but Dad, if we translated it from German and then over to Portuguese, it's a, it's, a, it's a no. Like Randy Jackson says, it's a no for me, Bob. Like you can try to change it however you want. It's a it's a no. Well, then sometimes they move on to the next question. Well, did he actually mean it? You know, when he said desserts. <laughs> Maybe he just meant no ice cream, but cupcakes, I don't know that I would put them in the dessert family because there's eggs in it. We could actually take that out and put that. What about pancakes? That's a breakfast food. Now, as a parent, like when I'm in dessert, when I, when I'm, you just brushed your teeth, okay? So I don't want you to get any food in your teeth because you just brushed them. And the reason why I told you no dessert is maybe I should have just said, well, Dad, I know that you said no food, but what about hot? <sighs> I just want you to go to bed. <laughs> right, and then they go to the next one. I, are you sure that's what you said? Yes. I mean, I'm 100% I'm sure. I do not want you to have dessert for bed. 
But did you? Yes. Right? Yes. Okay, but what can we do? You can go to bed. <laughs> right, but what about, I know that you said no dessert, no food, no pop, but what if, what if I lay down for 20 minutes, I get hungry, and then naturally I need to come down and get a snack? Children, I don't know how else to tell you this. No. If that's what we do. If we did that humanly, okay, uh, uh, all the parents in here, you know, we, our eyes would be bloodshot and we would be crazy people walking around. Like, I don't understand why my kids cannot understand this. And thankfully, my, my kids do not do that, but it, you would be able to tell what type of relationship we had if they just kept doing that. You would, you would be driving me crazy. Game. That's what we do with God's word. We go, yeah, but we do. We go through this whole game. Just think about if you did that in, the, in, in your relationships. To those that are single, the next time you're dating, just imagine if the person that you're dating starts going down the list of all of these things. Then you get married, and your spouse comes to you and goes, yeah, I know that we have some rules set out here. Like, I'm not supposed to sleep around anymore, but like, what can I do? All the wives in here would be like, oh, you know. and, and, and all the guys in here, we, wait, bro, what, what do you, what do you mean? This is, this is, we have, we have, right? It sounds crazy to say that within a relationship. We do it all the time, God. What can I do? What can I do? Did you really mean? And so it's interesting because as we look at these commandments, right, what we realize is you cannot follow this on your own. You're naturally like the made-up kids that I was talking about. We're naturally questioning and this and that. And it'll happen with everything, the way that we drive our car, right? Okay, when we, when we get on the highway, what do we say? It's 65, so I'm going to 70. I'm only going to go five over. But if you're a policeman, what would you say? Could you tell me what it says on the sign? Well, it says speed limit 65, so 65 is doing 75, so we're good. But it says the, the limit is 65. So that means you can hang out over here, but once you get here, you're breaking the law. Here we do it all the time. Here we do it with coupons at Kroger. Listen, I know this expired, but come on. It's a bottle of one, and it's my favorite creamer. You guys haven't done this deal in like a month. Right? We naturally are looking for like We're rule breakers. We love it. And when it comes to the Lord, we, we have no chance on our own. And so whenever you, we read this, right, that his commandments are not burdensome, each one of us should be going like, mm, yeah, right. Yeah, if you were to just look at the Ten Commandments, like how difficult it is to just, how difficult it was for them to try to follow just ten. And the ten summarize the whole law. So you go, okay, what am I supposed to do? You get to know Jesus. Once you start hanging out with Jesus, then you naturally are going to start wanting to follow his rules because the Holy Spirit is alongside of you. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. And so a person that gives their life to Jesus is naturally going to start to get to know God's word. And you can tell when somebody doesn't know God's word because they probably don't have a relationship with Jesus. And you guys, we see it everywhere, don't we? I had a conversation this last week with a guy that was trying to rationalize something politically with Scripture. And what I realized very early into this conversation is this guy's trying to use the Bible to defend his way of thinking. 
And that's never a good thing. Because once you read the Bible, what you realize is you can't just make up your own ways of thinking. God sets out the way that things are, and then you will naturally start to have a belief system after that. So the guy was saying to me, I, I, I don't know how you're okay with capital punishment. Something that he was very passionate about. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, thou shalt not murder. I said, but, like, capital punishment is biblical. Like, it's Verse 8 of that chapter says, keep the Sabbath. What's the punishment if you didn't keep the Sabbath? He goes, you get stoned. It's capital punishment. He goes, yeah, but why do we even follow the Sabbath today? Why are kids out there playing sports on Saturdays and Sundays? And I said, because Jesus has fulfilled the Sabbath. It's not, it's not like I get to make this stuff up. And I, I you know... I get where you are with capital punishment, but you can't just take something that you're passionate about and go, it's biblical to not believe in capital punishment. That's not true. All throughout Scripture, there is punishment. Like, Jesus came to take away our punishment, and the process that God picked to do that was capital punishment. Like, the cross is a symbol of capital punishment. And you can try to say a lot of things, just don't bring Jesus into it and say, Jesus was against it. If we have crosses on earrings and necklaces, it's, it's like, do you know what I mean? Like, you can't just put that one over because you're passionate about it. So we have to lay down our agenda when we come to God's Word. God's Word will naturally shape, shape our belief system. You go, oh, I'm going to spend it. And you said this is going to be a sled ride down the summit, and this is intense. Here's the thing that's awesome. Jesus taught on this, on what it looks like for us. Jesus said, listen, I get it that you guys struggle with all of the commandments. You struggle with 10. So let me make it really simple for you. And in Matthew 22, verse 36, he said, they said to him, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Because if you're worried about following all of these different commandments, just love God with all your heart. You give your life to Jesus, you are naturally going to start to understand that He sacrificed His life for you, and you're just going to go, that's awesome. That is so awesome. And then you're going to start to go, other people need to know how awesome that is. And you then are going to go back into the work to work, and the people that you used to struggle with, you're going to go, yeah, maybe the reason why they're so upset is because they need Jesus. And then you tell them. Now, they're not always open to it. And they go, you know, go, go fly a kite. Stop talking to me about Jesus. And then you come back and you read your Bible and you're like, God, why are they being so mean to me? I'm just trying to share them with you. You dig into your Bible and you realize that God's been doing the same exact thing with us since the beginning. We're a bunch of rascals and he's just trying to love on us. And so that person that you worked with that you used to struggle with, you just start praying before them. And you naturally will start loving others. And then, I don't know how this happens, but you will naturally start obeying these rules. Okay, before I gave my life to Jesus, I was a speedster on the road. I one time got pulled over driving to Pittsburgh twice in a matter of like five miles. Right? I got pulled over. He pulled me over. He gave me a warning. I got back in the, you know, back on the highway. I started speeding. I got pulled over again. I actually thought it was the same guy, right? I got pulled over. I was the last. One. He goes, "What's so funny?" And then I realized that's a different guy. And I don't know if they know. And I'm like, maybe. I, I, I used to speed so much, and I don't, I don't know why. Something crazy happened when I gave my life to Jesus. 
I started slowing down. And it's not because I just, like, I felt like, okay, I need to, to slow my roll. I just, I just naturally started obeying the law. I started looking on at things and saying, like, maybe I don't need to be driving so fast. And little by little, what I realized was I, the Holy Spirit inside of me is now helping me to obey even road signs. It's the same way that it is with the Lord. John also says his commands are not burdensome. Jesus said in Matthew, Matthew 11, he said, Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is When we look at all these things, we go, man, I have no idea how I'm going to follow all of these rules. We can't look at it that way. We've just got to come to Jesus. Jesus says, listen, I'm, I'm going to I'll carry you through it. I'm going to give you everything that you're going to need to walk out in your calling and in your life. Just come spend time with me. You will naturally start getting a love for your Bible. You're going to very much become like the psalmist of one, Psalm 119. And I can tell you, I don't know if you guys have ever dug into Psalm 119, but let's flip there right now. It is the longest chapter in the whole entire Bible. And if I could summarize Psalm 119 in one phrase, it would be, I love my Bible. Like this, the person that wrote Psalm 119 is absolutely crazy about their Bible. Listen to what some of the verses are in Psalm 119. This is the whole entire thing. There's, there's actually only two verses, I think, in the whole entire chapter that aren't about the love for God's Word. But listen to this person. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek Him with a whole heart. They also do know iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Go down to verse 7. I will praise you with, with uprightness of heart. And when I learn of your righteous judgments, I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. Verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Verse 10. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I mean, just pause about that for a minute. God, I want your word so badly. I, I want to follow your way so badly. That I, I'm hiding your word in my heart because I, I, don't, I don't want to sin against you. Verse 12, Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the ways of your testimonies as much as all the riches. I will meditate on your precepts. I will contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Verse 17, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may see the wonderful things from your law. You know, usually when you hear the law being talked about on the news, it's kind of like a punchline, isn't it? You know, somebody will bring something out from the Old Testament and they kind of bring it out well. You know, well, if you believe the Old Testament, then you also believe that you can't touch pigs dead big skin, so anybody that plays football, you know, they kind of laugh about the Bible. Well, in the Old Testament, it also says that you can't wear a cotton shirt, so preacher, man, you wear a cotton shirt? See? Can you imagine if you went to God's word like a psalmist of Psalm 119? Open my eyes that I might see the wondrous things from your law. But if we dug into the verses and we found out 
that God didn't want his Levitical priests to wear cotton. He wanted them to wear linen because he didn't want the work to be burdensome. So to answer your question or your punchline, I'm not a Levitical priest, so I, I can wear a cotton shirt. But if I was a Levitical priest in doing the service to the temple, yeah, I should be wearing a linen shirt. Well, what about, what about, what about? What if you went to your word in like Psalm 119, verse 18, and you said, open my eyes that I would see the wondrous things from your law? We wouldn't make the Old Testament a punchline anymore. We would dig into it to find out what it's going to teach us about Jesus. So let's get back to 1 John. He says, okay, verse 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Pause right there for a minute. Isn't that awesome? We are overcomers. No matter what happens, if you've given your life to Jesus, you will overcome. We win. The war is, is over. We're in a battle for souls right now. And we're trying to get more people in. But the work is finished. It's over. Next to victory, just a little quick nugget. Um, you could write the Greek word Nike, which is spelled N-I-K-E. Nike. Right? Greeks were all about different gods and things, right? So next to victory, you could write, that is the Greek word, uh, I guess you could say Nike, but Nike. The weapon of victory is faith, trust in Jesus. If you are born again, you have victory over this world by your faith. It's awesome. It means that it's done. You don't have to wonder anymore if there's another way to get to heaven. It's finished. It's over. And we've been given the, the key, the guide. Now John's going to go back through this truth and he's going to build on it for a couple of verses. Verse 6. He says, Now this is he who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, the blood. And these three agree as one. Pause right there for a minute. I want to go back to that, that, first, little, uh, that first little section. Actually, let's read. Verse 6 again. This is he who came by water and blood. Okay, you go, water and blood. I'm not sure that I totally get it. <clears throat> John actually does something really cool here, and I want you to flip to Matthew chapter 3. So he's telling us that we are, if we've given our lives to Jesus, we're safe. We have salvation. And now he's going to build on that, and he goes, listen. You don't have to wonder if this is true. We've actually got lots of witnesses to help us confirm it. And we've talked about before that all of the Old Testament prophecies that were filled, fulfilled by Jesus are enough to show us, oh my goodness, it would be impossible for somebody else to be the Messiah. And just think about our, our, our brothers and our sisters that are Jewish, that are waiting on the Messiah. Think about all the things that they have to look for in a Messiah. So they need to look for somebody that is, first of all, what? Born of a virgin. So it means if you're Jewish, you're looking for a Messiah, you... Okay. That's what you're looking for. To fulfill your scripture about the Messiah. That, that baby is also going to need to be born in Bethlehem. So we've got to look out for a vir baby that's born of a virgin in Bethlehem. Has to come out of Egypt. Raised in Nazareth. And that's just four. 
But then there's something else. He says, this is he who came by water and blood. You go, okay, just tell me what, what, what's happening here. Something happened at the water that is a witness for us. And in Matthew chapter 3, John, or uh, Matthew talks about it. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Listen to this, and then we'll pick it apart for a minute. He says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John in the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You say, oh, what, what, what exactly does that prove to us? Have you ever wondered why Jesus was baptized? If we need to be baptized because we're sinners, then why did Jesus do it? Well, Jesus' baptism was, was different. It was different from, from ours. It was even different from the baptism at that time. And there's a couple of interesting theories about why he was baptized. Some people believe that you know, in the book of Leviticus, when you turned 30 and you were a priest, there would be a washing that you would have to have before you would become a priest. Now that would make sense, except to be a Levitical priest, you would have to be born of the tribe of Levi. See, Jesus was born of the tribe of Judah. For Jesus to become the great high priest, like we talked about in Hebrews, he had to go through this priestly order of Melchizedek after he was risen from the grave. Okay, so we know that he wasn't baptized because he was becoming a Levitical priest. What he was doing was he was being baptized into a messiahship. This was something that was for him, and look at what happened. We also know that he became sin who knew no sin. Okay, so a couple other little things that add on is that Jesus was baptized because he was now identifying with us. There had to be a perfect person to, to, to walk a perfect life so that heaven's door could be opened up. So he's now a part of us, and he's revealing it to us. And there's a couple of things that should go off if this isn't the case. John the Baptist was a witness in a fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. There would be one. It would be the forerunner for the Messiah. When John the Baptist hits the scene, he is the fulfillment of that scripture. So if John the Baptist wasn't who he claimed to be, or if Jesus wasn't who he claimed to be, then John the Baptist would go, this can't happen. And John the Baptist struggled with, why are we doing this? But then what did he do? He submitted. So you have a fulfillment of prophecy going, Submit. I'm a witness. Right? Then what else do we see? The Holy Spirit comes down upon him. So the Holy Spirit is going, Gang, this is the one. And then, it doesn't just end there. The Father speaks and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So you go, okay, I'm still not sure that I understand the baptism. If you don't understand anything else, understand that this was a confirmation that Jesus was who he claimed to be. So the water, the experience that happened at baptism, it confirms that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And then it says, by water and blood. So you have the baptism experience that helps us to understand who he was, but then you also have the crucifixion. Him dying on the cross proved who he claimed to be. And just look up any of the prophecies that had to do with 
the Messiah dying, his blood being shed for us. And what you'll realize is the blood is a confirmation for us. And then it goes on and says, and it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. Okay, so if the Spirit wasn't telling the truth, he wouldn't have come on Jesus like a dove. Awesome. You've got multiple witnesses because you have four different writings of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why is there four? So that we could have multiple witnesses. So that when people come up and go, yeah, your Bible, it's, you know, it's outdated, it's... Do you have a figure that you follow that had four books written about him? Tell me, how can you prove what you believe in? Well, I don't believe in anything. Prove it to me. Prove to me that God doesn't exist. Because I have proof. No, I don't see him. That's right. God is invisible. But he said a visible representative of himself. And it's Jesus. And you need to give your life to him. Christian, we have to get bold because we've got the proof. You know why I think that the Bible should be taught in schools? Because not only is it the greatest book ever, it's a history book, it's a science book, it's a math book. And it's the truth. You go, but then, you know, people will get offended. They're going to get offended anyways. How can you teach world history without the greatest book of world history? He goes on. He says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are one. Long story short, God can be trusted. And I have yet to see God not defend himself through his word. And I challenge anybody. Well, you know, well, tell me about this little fallacy in the Bible. Let's read it. Let's open it up. Yeah, but, but you, you actually believe that the flood, like, like that it, that it like, flooded the whole world? Do you? Would you like to read it? I'll dig into it with you. There's actually multiple countries that have shown that the flood happened. It'll prove itself. I mean, let's dig in. We should be on the offense with these things. Because you're going to find out that God is really good at defending himself. And all he's looking for is a couple people that believe it. And just go, I may not have it all together, but I follow the one who does. I may screw this up at some point, but he'll take care of it. John then presses on this point. He says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he testified of his son. He who believes in the son has the witness in himself. He who does not believe, God has made him a liar. Because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Pause right there for a minute. You go, listen, John is really pressing it on here. He is. And it's awesome. John is pressing it on us because we need to be pressed on this. What he is unfolding for us is that even if we struggle to comprehend, we have this blessed assurance that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And every single one of us has the opportunity to grab it, hold on to it, and make it ours. You say, wait a minute. What are you saying is this golden nugget that can be trusted? This next verse one of my favorites. And I know I say I have a lot of favorite verses. But early on in my Christian walk, I was given this verse because I wasn't sure after I gave my life to Jesus if I was good. 
Right? We, we were trying to sort out, like, when we went forward and gave our lives to Jesus, if you mess up that week, do you then go back up and, and do it again? And then if you mess up, do you do it again? And the people that are up there, were they doing the same thing that I was doing, or are we all good? Right? Pastor Chuck took me to 1 John chapter 5. I'm sorry, it's another pastor. And he laid out this truth that I hung on to very early on in my Christian walk, and I've held on to it ever since. And any time that I doubt God, that I doubt his salvation, I go to this place. So this is one that should be circled, underlined. Because if you ever struggle with, am I good? You come here. Listen to what he says. Verse 13. These things I've written to you who believe in the Son of God. These things I've written to you. I'm writing this letter so that you get this. I heard week one we talked about why did he write this letter? This is the last reason. It's almost like saying if you didn't get anything yet, get this. I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Underline it. That no should have things around it. You should write that down somewhere. I know that I have eternal life because I have given my life to Jesus. And as the great theologian, this is a joke, Stevie Wonder once said, Sign, seal, delivered, I'm yours. When you give your life to Jesus, you are signed. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You have been given eternal life. It's signed. It's over. That's Jesus' book. When it comes to Judgment Day, he's going to look at this book, and if your name is written in that Lamb's Book of Life, you go in. If it's not, you go to this awful, fiery lake, and you spend eternity probably thinking about all the Christians that invited you to church and told you you need to be born again. So your name's got to be in there. There's no other way to put it. Before we take communion, we'll have that opportunity. You can, if you go, man, I, I don't know if it's signed it. Brought up in the church, but I don't know if I'm going to finish it today. Let it be done. If you go, well, you know, some people have a date when they gave their life to Jesus. Well, that's because they, they're signed. They don't want any doubt. It, 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 it's over. This was the day. For me, it was April 17, 2011. <laughs> Pow! Some people ask, well, you went through confirmation class when you were growing up in the Methodist church. Yeah, but I, I, I don't believe that I have accepted the gospel. I'm not good with, like, being... Uh, no. April 17, 2011, I made a confession of faith, and I got saved. Now, if I get to heaven and God goes, listen, you were good at 12, I don't care. Does anybody else try to confirm a flight twice and just to make sure? Right? I just want to make sure that my, like, did I actually, like, I'm checked in, I'm, like, I'm good, Right? Why would we do that with eternal life? If there's any question, let today be that day. Sealed. Signed, sealed, delivered. If you have given your life to Jesus, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Just look at Ephesians 1.13. You're delivered. If you've given your life to Jesus, he has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again, on whom we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse Signed, sealed, delivered, I'm yours. It is the most lopsided deal in the history of man, and I am pumped that I got it. You ever think about what God got out of that deal? He got this goofball, and he traded his perfect life for it. If we ever want to say that something's not fair, that's not fair. Now I'm, I'm taking full advantage of it. Because I'm his, right? He said it, I took it. You can't take it back. No take backs. 
So take it and hold on to it. All right, let's finish it up. And let's get ready to go to the communion table. Verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, which doesn't lead to death, he will ask, and he will give, he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There's sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Now, real quick before we go into that, it's it's a really interesting you know, uh, section of scripture. If you've ever heard somebody say, um, all sin is equal, you know, a sin is a sin is a sin, I, I struggle with that because of this section. Um, this verse, if, you know, kind of helps you to understand my hesitation. Is all sin bad? Yes. Is all sin sinful? Yes. Are they all equal? Uh, it's hard. Because John says, listen, there's some sin that leads to death. Okay, if, if you uh, are disobedient and you take a cookie when you're not supposed to, it's a much different sin than murdering somebody, isn't it? One of them, did Jesus die for stealing a cookie? Yes. Hallelujah. But it's a lot different that Jesus died for murder. There's different ramifications, aren't there? And so if you're one of those that goes, listen, sin is sin, I get it. I'm, I won't argue with you, but this is just why I struggle with it. Because I think what John is saying is, listen, man, there's, there's different consequences. And this is where he ends. He says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. It's things, doesn't it? And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true. And we're in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. I'm going to ask the music crew to come back up as we get ready to go to communion. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that just a powerful, powerful truth? And we don't have to wonder um, if our salvation is settled. John wrote this letter so that we would know. I want you to flip to Matthew chapter 26 and we go to the to the community table. <clears throat> I love in verse 20 where he says that God has given us understanding. God's given us understanding. He has revealed His truth to us. And that's something that we can praise the Lord in. And so we have a really neat opportunity now as we get ready to go to the communion table. And what we're going to do is, um, we very often go through First Corinthians, First Corinthians when, we, when we go to the communion table. And we're actually going to go through what Jesus said about the communion table. But one of the things that we typically talk about in communion is you've got to be careful with taking communion in, in an unworthy manner. And so I don't ever want to invite somebody to take communion without giving an invitation to get right with God first. And so if that's you today, and you go, man, I, I've been distant from God, or you were talking about being signed, sealed, and delivered, that whole Stevie Wonder thing, like, I, I don't know all about that, but I'm a little worried that I may be traced on the book of life right now. Then, then, then finish that. I'll be up here, they're going to play, and before you go and take me, you just make things right with the Lord. Make a confession of faith. The book of Romans, it says that if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, then we'll be saved. And so make sure that you've done that before you take communion. 
for everybody else, we have just a, an interesting way of taking communion, and that is you can feel free to come up and grab the elements and then go somewhere in the room if you like and spend some time alone with the Savior. Because this is the time when we get to come together and honor what Jesus did for us. And in Matthew chapter 26, <clears throat> It says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, he blessed, and he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, take and eat, and this is my body. And he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. From now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so we're going to do that in the, 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 the week then that we take. It is a symbol of God's perfect body broken for you. The juice that we take, the cranberry juice, it is a symbol of Jesus' perfect blood that was shed for the remission of all of our sins. And so let's just take some time. Feel free to come on up whenever you're ready and take the elements. Let's go spend some time with the Lord. Mm -hmm. 